I'm a bit of a health nut. I love kind of like taking supplements and being fit, but I can never understand what's going on in terms of evidence. There's always conflicting evidence. Should I take vitamin C? Should we take in wheatgrass? So this is a visualization of all the evidence for nutritional supplements. It's, this kind of diagram is called a balloon race. So the higher up the image, the more evidence there is for each supplement. And the bubbles correspond to popularity as regards to Google hits. So you can kind of immediately apprehend the relationship between efficacy and popularity. But you can also, if you grade the evidence, sort of do a worth it line. And so supplements above this line are worth investigating, but only for the conditions listed below. And then supplements below the line are perhaps not worth investigating. Now this image constitutes a huge amount of work. We scraped uh, like 1,000 studies from PubMed, the biomedical database and we compiled them and graded them all. But what it points to is that visualizing information like this is a, is a form of, of knowledge compression. It's a way of squeezing an enormous amount of information and understanding into a small space. And once you've curated that data, and once you've cleaned that data, and once it's there, you can do cool stuff like this. So I converted this into an interactive app. So I can now generate this application online, this visualization online. And I can say, yeah, brilliant. So it's, it spawns itself. And then I can say, well, just show me the stuff that affects heart health. So let's filter that out. So heart is filtered out, so I can see if I'm curious about that. I think, no, no, I don't want to take any synthetics. I just want to see plants and, and uh, just show me herbs and plants. There we go, all the natural ingredients. Now, this app is spawning itself from the data. The data is all stored in a Google Doc, and it's literally generating itself from that data. So the data is now alive. This is a living image. And I can update it in a second. New evidence comes out. I just change a row on a spreadsheet. Douche. Again, this the image re recreates itself. We're collecting and creating all kinds of data about how we're living our lives, and it's enabling us to tell some amazing stories. This is a project called Flight Patterns. What you're looking at is airplane traffic over North America for a 24-hour period. As you see, everything starts to fade to black, and you see people going to sleep. Followed by that, you see on the west coast, planes moving across the red-eye flights to the east coast. And you'll see everybody waking up on the east coast. Followed by European flights coming in the upper right-hand corner. Everybody's moving from the east coast to the west coast. And then you see San Francisco and Los Angeles start to make their journeys down to Hawaii in the lower left-hand corner. I think it's one thing to say there's 140,000 planes being monitored by the federal government at any one time. That's another thing to see that system as it ebbs and flows. This is a time-lapse image, that exact same data, but I've color-coded it by type. As you can see, the diversity of aircraft that are in the skies above us. I started making these images. I put them into Google Maps and allow you to zoom in and see individual airports and the patterns that are occurring there. So here we can uh, see the, the white represent low altitudes and the blue are higher altitudes. And you can zoom in. This is taking a look at Atlanta. You can see this is a major shipping airport and there's all kinds of activity there. You can also toggle between altitude for model and manufacturer. We'll see again the diversity. And you can scroll around and see some of, the different, some of the different airports and the different patterns that they have. This is scrolling up the East Coast. You can see some of the chaos that's happening uh, in New York with the air traffic controllers are having to deal with, with the, all those major airports next to each other. So zooming back out real quick, we see again the US. You get Florida down in the right-hand corner. Moving across to the West Coast, you see San Francisco and Los Angeles, big low traffic zones across Nevada and Arizona. And that's us down there in LA and Long Beach on the bottom. I started to take a look as well at different parameters because you can choose what you want to pull out from the data. This is looking at ascending versus descending flights. And you can see over time the ways the airports change. You see the holding patterns that start to develop in the bottom of the screen. And you can see eventually the airport actually flips directions. So this is another project that I worked on with the Sensible Cities Lab at MIT. This is visualizing international communication. So it's how New York communicates with other international cities. And we set this up as a live globe in the Museum of Modern Art in New York for the Designing the Elastic Mind exhibition. And it had a live feed with 24-hour offset, so you could see the change in relationship and kind of some demographic info kind of coming through AT&T's data and re revealing itself. This is another project I worked on with Sensible Cities Lab and in CurrentCity.org. And it's visualizing SMS messages being sent in the city of Amsterdam. So you're seeing the daily ebb and flow of people sending SMS messages from different parts of the city until we approach New Year's Eve, where everybody says, Happy New Year. <laughs> <clears throat> 
So this is an interactive tool that you can move around and, and see different parts of the city. Um, this is looking at another event. This is called Queen's Day. So again, you get this daily ebb and flow of people sending SMS messages from different parts of the city. And then you're going to see people start to gather in the center of the city to celebrate the night before, which happens right here. And then you can see people celebrating the next day. And you can pause it and step back and forth and, and see different phases. This room is a system in which it's considered that input and output spaces are co-located. It's a strangely simple uh, and yet unexplored idea, right? When you use a mouse, your hand is down here on the mouse pad. It's not even the same plane as what you're talking about. The pixels are up on the display. So here was a room in which all the walls, floors, ceilings, pets, potted plants, whatever was in there, was capable not only of display but of sensing as well. And that means input and output are in the same space enabling stuff like this. That's a digital storage in a physical container. The contract is the same as with real-world objects in real-world containers. It has to come back out, whatever you put in. This little design experiment that, uh, that was a small office here knew a few other tricks as well. If you presented it with a chessboard, it tried to figure out what you might mean by that. And if there was nothing for them to do, the chess pieces eventually got bored and hopped away. The uh, academics who were overseeing this work <laughs> thought that that was too frivolous. So this stuff was undertaken at MIT in the Media Lab under the incredible direction of Professor Hiroshi Ishii, director of the Tangible Media Group. But it was that work that was uh, seen by Alex McDowell, one of the world's legendary production designers. But Alex was preparing a little sort of obscure indie art house film called Minority Report for Steven Spielberg and invited us to come out from MIT and design the interfaces that would appear in that film. Uh, and the great thing about it was that Alex was so dedicated to the idea of verisimilitude, the idea that the, the putative 2054 that we were painting in the film be believable, that he allowed us to take on that design work as if it were an R&D effort. And the result um, is sort of gratifyingly perpetual. People still reference those sequences in Minority Report when they talk about new UI design. And that led full circle in a strange way to, to build these ideas into what we believe is the necessary future of human-machine interface. The spatial operating environment, we call it. So here we have a bunch of stuff, some images. And using a hand, we can actually exercise six degrees of freedom, six degrees of navigational control. And it's fun to fly through Mr. Beckett's eye. You can come back out through the scary orangutan. That's all well and good. Let's do something a little more difficult. Here we have a whole bunch of disparate images. We can fly around them. So now a fundamental issue. You have to be able to navigate in 3D. M much of what we want computers to help us with in the first place is inherently spatial, uh, and the part that isn't spatial can often be spatialized to allow our wetware to make greater sense of it. Now, we can distribute this stuff in many different ways, so we can throw it out like that. Let's reset it. We can organize it this way. And of course, it's not just about navigation, but uh, about manipulation as well. So if we don't like stuff or we're intensely curious about Ernst Haeckel's scientific falsifications, we can pull them out like that. And then if it's time for analysis, we can pull back a little bit and ask for a different distribution. Let's just come down a bit and fly around. So that's a different way to look at stuff. If you're of a more analytical nature, then you might want actually to look at this as a color histogram. So now we've got the stuff color sorted, angle maps into color. And now if we want to select stuff, 3D space, the idea that we're tracking hands in real space becomes really important because we can reach in, not in 2D, not in fake 2D, but in actual 3D. Here are some selection planes and we'll perform this Boolean operation because we really love yellow and tapirs on green grass. So from there to uh, the world of real work, here's a logistics system, the, a small piece of one that we're currently building. Um, there's a lot of elements. And one thing that's very important is to combine traditional tabular data uh, with three-dimensional and geospatial information. So here's a familiar place. And we'll bring this back here for a second. Maybe select a little bit of that and bring out this graph. 
And we should now be able to fly in here and have a closer look. And these are logistics elements that uh, are scattered across the United States.